special presentation of Yavapai Broadcasting News. Join Paul David and Kyle Benedict as they talk with our community's leaders, newsmakers, and people in the know. You'll hear about the hot topics that affect all our lives in Yavapai County. And now here's today's Countywide. Welcome to County Wide. I'm Paul David. Great to have you in the studio with us today. We've got Pete Gordon, uh, Fire Staff Officer for the Prescott National Forest. We're actually going to do two shows with Pete. One today talking about the Goodwin Fire itself, and then second show we're going to record right after this first one here. And we're going to have Pete uh, talk about the rehabilitation work that's taking place out there because that fire did impact so many different communities uh, by the Goodwin Fire down by Mayor. Welcome to studio, Pete. Well, glad to be here. Good to have you back. Thank uh, you. So let's jump into it. June 24th, the Goodwin Fire ignited. And the first report I saw was it was about a 20 foot by a 40 foot fire. And it, it quickly changed from that. Uh, yeah, it did. So this was late in the afternoon, I want to say around 3, 3.30 in the afternoon. Um, right about the peak time when temperatures are at their highest, uh, we get the gusty afternoon winds. Uh, and unfortunately this fire was in uh, kind of the, the perfect place for a, a difficult fire to fight. Okay. Um, it was well off, of, well not well off the road, but off of the, off the uh, good, um, excuse me, off the Senator Highway. Um, but right at the toe of a slope in very thick uh, chaparral, me, uh, taller than the firefighters' heads, um, and just very difficult to get to. Um, you said toe of a slope, so at the bottom of a hill? Yeah. Okay. Or if, but it, what it looks like to me was at the bottom of uh, or side of a drainage. Okay. Um, but all, right. so and all those got, drainages lead to big bugs. It's got bugs. this upward it trend it can take, which is, of course, dangerous. Yep. Yep, and uh, you know the near we had folks uh, in the vicinity that got there within a few minutes. I think 10 to 20 minutes they were able to get to the scene. But by that time the fire was pretty well established. For us to get our nearest fire engine in there uh, that far south of uh, Prescott and that far off of 69, uh, the fire just got too well established uh, in the chaparral, which at that time of year is just as volatile as can be with the temperatures and the uh, the, the dry days. And like I said, just decadent. Uh, Old Chaparral hasn't burned in over 45 years in that particular area, so this stuff was 12 foot tall plus. Um, and when it gets that old, that tall, um, there's a tremendous amount of dead material mixed in. And um, like I said, it's kind of the perfect place for the worst fire. Chaparral, I would say, probably grows pretty close together too. It's a pretty tight community of plant. Um, yeah, well, yeah. As, as if you can picture uh, Manzanita and some of the, the Turbinella oak, uh, Cianotha, some of those species that make up our Highland Chaparral. Mm -hmm. um, there may be three, two, three, four feet between the base of each uh, plant, but as they grow and spread upward, um, the, 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 what we would call the canopy or the treetops are all intermixed, much sure. like a thick pine forest. So that fire's uh, just walking from one, one to the next. It does. As we were talking uh, earlier before the show, when, the, when a chaparral fire burns actively, it's, it's, I'd say it's either on or it's off. Um, there are times where we may be, we would struggle to get the chaparral to burn when it's uh, in spring green up um, or if there's not a lot of dead material but when it's dead and dry and old um, and warm out it gets into the crowns and it burns like a like a pine forest crown fire that's literally what happens there's very little fire spread on the ground because there's not much ground fuel in a pure chaparral stand um, so it gets into the tops of these six foot eight foot or fifteen foot tall uh, chaparral and and it just moves treetop to treetop and it's extremely difficult to to contain or control a lot would, of heat. Would you say chaparral is um, explosive when it burns? Because uh, I mean, some stuff just burns and falls down. Sure. But then, I mean, I've, I've burned pine with some really serious pitch in it or some juniper and you, you could see those pops and those sure. going on. What is chaparral like when it's burning? Um, it, it burns with a tremendous amount of energy. The release of energy in, in, in terms of BTUs or the, the amount of heat energy it puts out is incredible. Um, it's, it's difficult to, uh, you can't get near it, first of all, so we can't really put uh, ground firefighters up there. Um, we have, sometimes it's limited or marginal effectiveness with the retardant because it's so hot. Um, it'll either dry out or evaporate sometimes the retardant or water from a helicopter drop. Um, so it's, it is volatile, it, is, it can be explosive. And, and like I said, we, uh, we tend to talk in terms of it's either on or off. Um, if, if days are cool and there's not, or we get into the nighttime where the radiant heat is no longer really a factor, um, it's not uncommon to see chaparral just lose its energy. But that is not always the case, especially middle of the summer when it's hot and dry and when it's so decadent. 
Uh, and we saw some pretty active fire behavior at night on the Goodwin fire just for those very reasons. This wasn't burning on flat ground either, was it? No, there certainly were, were areas with less slope and less topography, but for the most part, um, that part of the Bradshaws is very broken country made up of a lot of drainages. Um, as folks are probably aware, it burned up and over Big Bug Mesa, which is a very big flat top. The fire behavior changed dramatically up on top, but uh, getting there, uh, we, we had what we call alignment. Many drainages leading from southwest to northeast, uh, which is often parallel to the uh, prevailing winds. Uh, so you had slope, you had drainages, you had the influence of the wind pushing upward towards Big Bug. Uh, and then we have drainages all sorts of directions and when you crisscross drainages or you have uh, multiple directions that really influences the wind and therefore influences the fire behavior. So we had uh, difficulty managing that on the east side of Big Bug uh, and once it got over towards uh, Poland Junction it was under the influence of the canyon that, up towards Breezy Pine. That, that canyon uh, was a tremendous influence on the easterly direction. Hmm. So, okay, so, so far what we have is we got really dry, really old, really tall chaparral. Yep. Grows close together and the fire's just jumping through there and having a good time. Uh, we've got a lot of drainages and it's burning at the bottom of these drainages and just running straight up them. Mm -hmm. The third factor that I noticed, and it was Tuesday that we really saw things just explode yeah. on the Goodwin fire. The wind was, yep. uh, I was telling you, I was standing behind the radio station here, and you could actually look down at the ground and see the pine needles moving in all different directions because the wind was just like swirling out there. Mm -hmm. So you had strong winds as well. We did. So the, we, I would say the winds were influential on the fire since the first day, Saturday afternoon. But the notable event was on Tuesday. Um, uh, well, uh, backing up Monday, there was a significant, Sunday and Monday, significant fluctuation in the wind patterns, even at night, to the point where the fire uh, slopped over or was pushed over the Mayor Goodwin Road to the south. Once that occurred, now we had fire on, uh, quote unquote, the wrong side of the road. For Monday, when we got some westerly influence, uh, you know, desert heating on the west side of the Bradshaws, uh, mixing with the prevailing winds, mixing with the topography, we got a westerly component. Uh, pushed the fire Monday uh, towards the east, um, and then Tuesday was uh, sort of the banner day. The wind's even stronger, um, 30 to 50 mile an hour winds, uh, gusts up to 50, pushed that fire east in a, in a large direction along the Mayor Goodwin Road and both sides of the Mayor Goodwin Road uh, to the point by mid, uh, I want to say midday, somewhere between I think 11 and 1, that really took off and started moving northeast towards Mayor, Poland Junction, the Highway 69 corridor, and all due to strong wind influence, uh, uh, influenced or accelerated by the terrain. At that point, with that kind of wind going on, I mean, we were obviously we probably had crews in the ground. It's time to get them out of there, I would imagine. Yeah, absolutely. Right? And, and, I, and I can tell you that the, the crews anticipated this. We get fairly good weather forecasts. Uh -huh. uh, part of the, when we have a team, a uh, type one team or a type two team, that we bring on these uh, complex incidents, they, they bring with them an incident meteorologist. This is someone who's trained in fire behavior but is a meteorologist provided by the Weather Service. Uh, they'll work in conjunction with our local meteorologists and flag staff and, and do some very good pinpoint forecasting for the fire itself. So the folks were pretty well prepared and were anticipating high winds coming from the west on Tuesday. Um, and so part of the strategy that day was to uh, ensure that we weren't up close. We had ways to get folks out, um, and, uh, and they did. There was uh, absolutely no close calls. The firefighters knew uh, where to be. The, the team and the, the tacticians that were running every uh, portion of the fire, uh, they had a plan well in place, and they knew that when this thing did it, they were ready for it, and they moved out of the way and got back in as soon as it was safe to do so. And, mm -hmm undoubtedly probably saved a few structures by doing that. Okay, all right, let's take our first break. Prescott National Forest Fire Staff Officer Pete Gordon is in studio today. We're talking about the Goodwin Fire. Stick around, County Wine will be back in just a couple minutes. Hey you. Yeah you, getting that college education, what are you gonna do? Graduate and take some office job? Be like everybody else. Or will you dare do something different? Like be a teacher. You could be my teacher. You got the skills, the smarts. Yes, you. You could be the teacher I never forget. That would be cool. Does that corporate job even have recess? What are you going to make of yourself? What are you going to make of me?
Music, Q102.9, plays all the hits. Yo, what's going on? This is Trissy Drake. Ariana Grande. Maroon 5. This is Rihanna. I'm with the I'm Shawn Mendes. Hey, it's Bruno Mars. Ed Sheeran. What's up, guys? It's Justin Bieber. You're listening to The Weeknd. Start your day with Brian James in the morning. You'll get at least 10 songs in a row during your ride home with Julie Page. Zach Sang Show. Catch the Zach Sang Show weeknights 7 to midnight. And Kelly Fox weekends on your home for hit music. The Q102.9 and 104.9 in Prescott and Cottonwood. Stand with me. Be drug free. Stand with me. Be drug free. To make a difference, we must stand together. Stand with me. Be drug free. Supporting our families and listening to our teens. Stand with me, be drug free. Stand with me, be drug free. We are all one. No one is immune. Stand with me, be drug free. Let's stand together for a healthier community. Stand with me, be drug free. Welcome back to Countywide Prescott National Forest Fire Staff Officer Pete Gordon in studio today. We're talking about the Goodwin Fire. We've talked about the conditions that were out there. Now, the, the next thing was we've got evacuations taking place. And I always hate to see that when the evacuations sure. are taking place. But with the wind and the way the fire was moving and stuff, it, it happened really fast. Uh, and then when you look at the map and you see um, Breezy Pines yep. was first. Yes. It had some of the evacuations going first. And then when I saw it was Mayor and Poland Junction that were being evacuated, I thought, oh boy, this is really getting, this is getting mm -hmm. close. This is getting yep. really close. Now those evacuations, they occur when the fire gets within a mile, a mile and a half. They were a pre-evacuation, I guess, first. Yeah. So, yeah. so there's uh, when we when we make the recommendation, first it's, it's important to know that it's the sheriff, uh, county sheriff's authority. Yeah, the Pike uh, sheriff's yep, office. Yeah. And and ultimately the decision to evacuate. But obviously we work very closely with uh, the sheriff and, and his deputies. Um, and we were lock and step all uh, all week, uh, well weekend, uh, as this thing approached. The evacuation, from a management standpoint, uh, between the forest and the fire team, we'll we'll ask for trigger points or what we call management action points, uh, for all sorts of different tactics or uh, protection efforts. But one of those is almost always in in this type of condition, uh, an evacuation trigger. Um, and um, that often starts with a pre-evacuation notice, uh, sometimes a 24-hour, and it's, it's an estimate based on fire movements and, and the ability to, to work a fire. Um, we'll need some time to evacuate folks. We make that recommendation, they'll give the notice, uh, and then it'll hit another trigger point where you know, we think it's inevitable or highly likely, um, and we try to do this in a timely manner. I will say on the Goodwin Fire, from my experience, uh, uh, on being on many of these from a team standpoint or managing them from a forest, um, I would say we were fairly proactive and, and well ahead of that power curve for most of the fire. Not always the case. Sometimes these fires move faster than we can anticipate, and we're doing a very rushed, hurried evacuation. Um, the good but it's good for people to know that, too. That yeah. does happen, where Absolutely. sometimes it's a knock on the door. We've talked with yep. YCSO about this. Sometimes it's a knock on the door, and it's like, you Get need out. to go. Yep. You can see that fire barreling right down yep. behind them. So. Yep. This worked very well, uh, and to the point where uh, uh, on Wednesday, the, the day after the big push, we were concerned that it's set up now that it might come up and over the ridge into Walker. So we worked with the team, the forest and the team uh, talked it over first thing in the morning. We worked with the sheriff, made the recommendation, and by Wednesday we were evacuating more folks in the Blue Hills area, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, west side of 69, and Walker. Uh, I think overall about 8,000 people were evacuated for the Goodwin Fire. I'd say it went pretty smoothly too. Red Cross didn't sound like yeah. they were having any troubles. I think with the evacuations this time around, we're gonna to try to get uh, with emergency management too. I believe it's uh, next week we're gonna be mm -hmm. talking about this. Uh, the animals, Yeah. it was, you know, we, we've had uh, with the Yarnell Fire, yep. and um, we, we've had the, the situation where there's a lot of livestock and stuff coming out, but this one, like you mentioned, it's thousands of people and their pets mm -hmm. and their livestock, so it got to be a much bigger thing. So we'll yep. definitely have them talk a little bit yep. about that as well. Um, there seemed to be a point where the, the fire was, you know, getting down towards Mayer, and I remember on the release there was a, there was a buffer mm -hmm. that had been put in place. Uh, the governor had opened up some funds and a buffer had been put in place. Yeah, Is I, it? The, you're, you're, you're correct. There was um, uh, an mm -hmm. effort by state forestry and fire management, uh, I don't know how long ago, I think with, you know, recent, future, uh, recent past, mm -hmm. Um, they did some fuel break work where okay. they, I think they might have used their Department of Corrections crews and maybe some equipment. Um, the specifics I don't know, but it was a fuel break much like we do on Forest Service land. 
Um, they worked with private folks, uh, private land and state land there adjacent to the forest and adjacent to mayor and put in a fuel break. And uh, from all indications, uh, it worked, it was pretty effective. The other thing that uh, was effective, if I could say so, for the forest standpoint, uh, two years ago we had the S.A. Hill fire. This was uh, a fire that started about this time, uh, you know, we were into the monsoons, it was about this time of year, July. Uh, it was a lightning strike uh, fire that we chose to manage for a benefit to, to clean the forest floor. The fire behavior was minimal. We got about 4,000 acres burned, much like we would do with a prescribed burn. Mm -hmm. uh, southeast portion of the Gouin fire hit that burn and the fire behavior dropped out. It just slows it right down. It slows it right down. And we saw that last that year really too near care. Arnell. Yep. Because they had the same break. Absolutely. Put in. Same same idea. And that's the you know, we talk about the defensible space on people's homes mm -hmm. and properties where you're supposed to push that, you know, thirty feet out and yep. thirty feet away from your home. And uh, somebody tweeted out a picture of a forest uh, Forest Lookout Tower this week, and it showed a before and after. And the before mm -hmm. was, you know, the trees all the way around it, but then the after, it's just this tower with nothing around it. And, mm -hmm. you know, the fire's going to have a hard time getting there. Absolutely. So we got some defensible space going on around the communities. And we've been talking about this, too. Yep. People, homes and, and neighborhoods that are backed up right against the Forest Service, if we can get in there and clean out all that dead debris and get rid of that stuff, it really changes a fire's activity. A absolutely. It's um, I think probably the most important message I'd like to convey is that it's a partnership. You know, the, whether it's state land, BLM, Forest Service, um, you know, we do our part to try to prevent fires from coming off of the public land and onto private. Uh, but it needs to be a partnership with private homeowners, landowners to do their part to really protect their interests and their values. Um, so the two have to work together. And I would say, um, you know, uh, the Avapai County, uh, the Prescott National Forest, Phoenix District BLM, State Forestry. In Yavapai County, it's probably one of the best efforts in the country of, of um, partnering to do projects, projects that are adjacent to each other, projects that complement each other. Um, we support each other to, to solicit funds or compete for funds to do these projects. Uh, and we've got a few cases, and now Goodwin, a portion of Goodwin, is an example of that. Mm -hmm. And um, for those that haven't uh, climbed on board, I would encourage every homeowner to look very seriously at their property uh, and, and do what they can to protect their values. I think in a previous show you've let me share that what it really comes down to is uh, f from our standpoint uh, on the Prescott National Forest, we're looking at it a little differently. We look at it, if we do this work, we're protecting firefighters first so that in second they can protect the values or the homes or the communities or resource values. Um, if we're not doing something to restore the fuel conditions back to historic and back to healthy conditions, then it's just too dangerous to put firefighters in there to protect things that need to be protected. Yeah. So we take that approach. We look at it first like we're protecting firefighters. And so if the homeowners would do the same, then there's a chance the firefighters would have a tactical advantage. They could safely do some protection. Yeah, proactive instead of reactive. Yep. I think that's what it is. All right, let's take our second break. Prescott National Forest Fire Staff Officer Pete Gordon in the studio today. We're talking about the Goodwin Fire, which is now 100% contained. It's countywide back in just a couple minutes. Q102.9 plays all the hits. Yo, what's going on? This is Trissy Drake. Ariana Grande. I'm Maroon 5. This is Rihanna. I'm Adele. I'm Shawn Mendes. Hey, it's Bruno Mars. Ed Sheeran. What's up, guys? It's Justin Bieber. You're listening to The Weeknd. Start your day with Brian James in the morning. You'll get at least 10 songs in a row during your ride home with Julie Page. Zach Sang Show. Catch The Zach Sang Show weeknights 7 to midnight. And Kelly Fox weekends on your home for hit music. The Q102.9. And 104.9 in Prescott and Cottonwood. This was me. And mom and dad. And my big brother Alex. And Jack. And this was the day that I learned that sandals get their name from sand. That jellyfish aren't made of jelly that stars don't just come from the sky. That the ocean is bigger than all of us. This is the day we all got to forget that I was sick. And it changed everything. This was my wish. 
I call you and say, I'm with the IRS. You owe back taxes, and if you don't pay today, you're going to jail. You can fix this by sending cash. And you actually believe me. Too smart to fall for it? Well, last year, Americans paid $100 million to guys like me. One in six people were scammed. Can you believe it? Well, you shouldn't. I just made that up, too. <laughs> you are a little gullible. Welcome back to County Wide. We're talking with uh, Fire Staff Officer for the Prescott National Forest, Pete Gordon, about the Goodwin Fire and just kind of how that all played out because it is now officially 100% contained as of July 10th, 100% contained. It burned 28,516 acres. Structures, um, there's numbers that have been put out, but I have not received any official numbers as to how many structures were destroyed by that fire. So I have not mentioned how many structures destroyed. I'm waiting for uh, Yavapai Emergency Management or the Yavapai County Sheriff's Office. Someone's going to release that information. When they do, we'll pass that along. But I don't want to say how much it is based on a helicopter that was up in the sky and got a great picture of what was going on down on the ground below. <clears throat> um, so we talked about th the fire started how? Let's well, real quick. Um, I it started, it was human caused, human uh, caused, without a doubt. We had no lightning in the area. Some um, form of carelessness occurred and then the fire started. Most likely. Uh, we also saw during this fire, uh, mm. the first arrest I know of, of somebody using a drone yep. over a fire, which was uh, good to see because we've talked about that numerous times. However, even after that arrest occurred, yeah. July 3rd and July 4th, you guys both days had another drone pop up mm -hmm. and that shuts down all the activity. Yep. But I think with this, what's coming out of this is we're understanding now that these drones, not only are you putting the aircraft in danger, the crew in danger on that aircraft, but once that comes into airspace, they no longer, the crews on the ground no longer have the air support. That's right. So now these crews have got to back off and, and everything shuts down. Absolutely. So here we go. We got this fire. It's just burning away. And those, those shutdowns last how long? 30 minutes, an hour, two um, hours? If, uh, if I remember correctly, the one... <clears throat> excuse me, where the gentleman was actually arrested, that was the end of, the, they shut it down for the rest of the day. Oh. Um, it took that long to clear the area and, and make sure that drone was out of here, uh, out of the fire area to the point where we were out of daylight hours for the aircraft to fly safely. Okay. So very big, big impact. What was the turning point of the Goodwin fire where everybody kind of took a deep <clears throat> breath and said, okay, I think we're gonna be okay now? Um, it was, I think, several things that came together on that Wednesday, Thursday time period. So after it made the big push on Thursday, Wednesday's forecast, uh, we were a little concerned we'd have s uh, southerly winds that might push it up and over into Walker. <clears throat> Those winds didn't materialize as well as we, or as, as strong as we thought. That combined with the great efforts folks made to contain what blew on, blew out on Tuesday, I'd say Wednesday, Thursday was a turning point, particularly a couple of places. Um, the ability to uh, keep the spread going further through Breezy Pines, through the Poland Junction, across Poland Junction Road, okay. uh, as well as the stuff that- That was northwest? Uh, northwest corner of um, the fire? I would say almost the center of the north perimeter. Okay, um, okay. There was activity, uh, this would be another turning point. So real quick, I want to point out that, you know, on, on Tuesday, a significant portion blew across Highway 69 and right. was set up behind uh, the Dewey Humboldt community. Um, the wonderful effort by our firefighters there to take care of that Tuesday night and then hold on to it Wednesday that was another large turning point. That prevented a whole nother uh, set of complexities of, of the fire moving into Dewey Humboldt. Then the effort in the uh, Breezy Pine, Poland uh, Junction area, that whole northern perimeter was another turning point. And then finally, by the time we got into Wednesday, Thursday, and into Friday, um, our, the, the team that managed the fire and all of our ground resources, including our very own Prescott Hotshots, happened to be home for this fire and to have the local expertise was uh, a, a stroke of luck, but uh, we made good use of that. The northwest corner up on Big Bug where the canyon from Breezy Pine tops out to the west, um, that was a critical piece of ground. We're into the pine trees, um, we're up against the ridge against Walker. Um, there was some great work done there, very slow, very deliberate, very purposely uh, implemented uh, line construction supported by aircraft and a, a very moderate burnout over several days that was probably the final turning point into the weekend to where we felt that we've, we've taken the sting out of this thing and we're, we can start putting some confidence in that containment. 
We're on time. Perfect. Way to end that one. That sure. was just perfect. All right. My so there's the Goodwin Fire in the Nutshell. Now, Pete's going to stay with <laughs> us here, and we're going to air the next show on July 13th. It'll be this Thursday, uh, talking about the, the bear team that came in and have taken assessment of the area and what kind of work is going to be done to kind of rehabilitate the area charred by the Goodwin Fire. That's today's Countywide. Thanks for watching and listening, and we'll talk to you again next time.